First of all, I would like to express my thanks to Lisa Rosendahl, Bina Choi and Grant Watson for inviting me to Stockholm. It's a great pleasure to take part in this amazing meeting on internationalism. I would also like to thank Xue Yin Chen for all her organizational work. Unfortunately, I was not able to join the conference from its beginning and I much regret not being familiar with yesterday's presentations. This is due to master exams at my academy in Vienna and I, it was really impossible to miss that. <laughs> so um, I'm very sorry. The invitation to present a paper here at IASPIS came at short notice a couple of weeks ago and obviously it was directly related to a recently published article in which I speak about, uh, at the time, new and different modes of internationalism in what I call transcultural modernism. The mentioned essay and with it my contribution to this conference considers itself as an intervention into the current global art discourse from a historical perspective which is informed by a post-colonial approach. Contrary to the widespread fixation on a post-1989 periodization of arts globalization, this paper calls for a localization of 20th century 20th century's transcultural contexts and alliances of artists, critics, activists in the context of, early, of the early decolonization movements. Despite the universal aspirations of a global art history, which is um, quite prominently discussed during the last about 10 years or so, the debates surrounding it are still defined by the dichotomy of Western versus extra-European art histories. To overcome this dichotomy, we will need to examine relations of exchange and interdependency between modernities and modernisms in different world regions with a view to their colonial and post-colonial power relations. Our focus should be on concrete contexts and alliances between actors rather than on categories such as influence and reception. Um, that's among others because those who have spent the least time talking about global art have contributed more to the emergence of a post-Eurocentric post perspective on art than a widely current global talk that was manifestly a response to the pressure to, to change how things are done in fundamental ways and as quickly as possible. If we are... Um, if we inquire why this need is felt with such particular urgency today, we are often told about the year 1989 when the global order changed profoundly and so the inception of a new art and art history should allegedly be dated in retrospect to the same year. So, um, fixated on the global reorganization of the art world that supposedly happened in 1989, um, Hans Belting and Peter Weibel, for instance, uh, who are very prominent uh, figures in this field in the, in the German-speaking world, but um, also um, not only restricted to the German-speaking world. They paint a picture of history in which the events of 1989 were, were what first rendered the non-Western world capable of articulating its cultural and political diversity, contesting the exclusive exclusivity of Western art and demanding its share. So this is just one very prominent uh, example, um, this exhibition and, and book they edited. With this after 1989 narrative, uh, Weibel, uh, Belting, but also many others, 
erase at one stroke the ambitions and accomplishments of many decades of anti-colonial movements and the contested history of non-Western modernities and modernisms. And uh, it fits perfectly into this post after uh, post uh, 89 narrative that the famous exhibition Magicien de la Terre in Paris uh, which it, it has become conventional to pinpoint to as the global, as the moment global art was born, took place in 1989. I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with this exhibition, in, uh, which was uh, curated by Jean Hubert Martin in Paris and was called the first truly international um, exhibition, uh, which was based on the concept to. Um, show 50 Western artists um, and 50 non-Western artists together in one exhibition and which was um, heavily criticized by many artists and uh, writers for, their, for the special conditions under which this new inclusiveness um, <coughs> extended to non-Western contemporary artists um, took place and which um, could be described as a certain form of neo-exoticist um, approach to contemporary art practice in the non-Western uh, regions, um, opposing a certain image of the contemporary artist as a, as a conceptual artist, an intellectual, an autonomous artist, and, uh, and a media-based artist on the Western side, and on the other side, uh, um, kind of artist as a craftsman and uh, integrated into rituals and so on. So this I'm sure you're quite familiar with. Also this sort of applied arts, this uh, functional arts vis-a-vis uh, -vis the autonomous artwork of the Western artists. So other, um, other initiatives launched mostly by academic art historians seek to construct a global perspective out of a combination of era studies or its art historical relatives, the histories of East Asian, Islamic and Latin American art. They work on an application across historical eras of uh, analytical parameters such as cultural transfer, cultural translation and transculturality, which they borrow from more recent post-colonial theories, where one should note um, they were derived from the analysis of colonial and post-colonial constellations. Such abrupt universalization may produce novel and often fruitful descriptions of the trans-regional properties of many, including older artistic phenomena in diverse parts of the world. But still, Many of these academic institutional endeavors are blind to the history of the present moment in their own way. The problem in this instance, which is the academic approach to global art history, is not so much with the object of study as in the global contemporary art, but with the topicality of new questions which are proffered with, with the gesture, gesture of an urgently needed fresh start and embellished with an aura of a paradigm shift. James Elkins, American art historian, whose authority is often cited in these debates, notes in the introduction to Is Art History Global, uh, a book he edited in 2007, that, quote, art history is becoming a, becoming a global enterprise. Uh, a remarkable line of argument leads Elkins from the heavy concentration of institutional art history in North America and Western Europe and the strong fixation of Western art historians on the canon to the claim that art historians in other parts of the world work with the same methods and references. And so, he argues, there are plainly no alternatives. I quote again, there is no non-Western tradition of art history. Elkin's questions and answer game um, on the challenges of art history vis-à-vis uh, -vis the, the globalization process exemplifies the frequently hypothetical quality 
of the questions academic art historians ask themselves. Approaches such as Weibel and Belting's, as well as Elkin's, manifest two problematic tendencies, which one could call the dehistorization de de and depoliticization. One school, which vocally champions the most recent globalization of art and its, and its worldwide contemporaneity, negates the modernity of art all over the world during the preceding century. The other school, most of whose representatives are academic art historians, often adapts snippets of theory and concepts from post-colonial studies, migration and diaspora studies, which it applies rather briskly to the art of all eras and world regions. By sketching the new picture of an art history that has basically always been transcultural, it negates in its own way the global dimensions of modernism, which started asking questions about transcultural and transcontinental relations in artistic practice and the reflection on art long ago. To counteract these tendencies of global art history with a different perspective, I think that we should start by exploring historic constellations in which the colonial worldview and the hegemony of Western ideas about civilization and culture, progress and modernity were challenged. Of particular interest in this context is a historical period in which the beginnings of the era of decolonization coincided with prominent shifts in the visual arts. The early 20th century can be addressed as a period to put modernism in the focus of our reflections on the globality of art. The globalization of art in the beginning of the 20th century occurs in the political and discursive context defined by the emergence of a network connecting anti-colonial movements around the world and the simultaneous struggle against racist discrimina discrimination also in the, in the West. At the moment when the colonial empires have reached their largest extension, <coughs> which was before World War I, the foundations of a post-colonial world are being laid. In the field of art, we may observe significant changes regarding the mutual relations between the artistic output of different world regions. In one or another form, the various protagonists respond to similar sets of problems. What is new about this transcontinental artistic production of modernism is perhaps best illustrated by a comparison with the old relations between the arts of different cultures in modernity. It is not in dispute that Japanism in late 19th century European art and primitivism in early 20th century art were important factors of uh, aesthetic innovation in Western modern art. But the echoes of Japanese color wood cuts and African <coughs> sculpture in the works of artists like uh, Van Gogh and Picasso um, were not part of a transcultural contact between Asian and African artists and their European colleagues. This is just another um, example of Japanese from my own uh, Viennese context. They did not initiate a relation of exchange between artistic concepts from the respective continents. This internationalism of the canonical modernism was a European and then later on a European North American phenomenon. It remained within the spheres of the colonial powers. The situation changes fundamentally with the... Um, there's always a problem with uh, labeling and uh, yeah, naming such <laughs> trends, but I call it for the moment as the transcultural global modernism that commences in the early 20th century. In many places around the world, unilateral appro appropriation, like Van Gogh and Picasso um, are representatives of, gives way to an explicit interest in encounters with representatives of other cultural spheres. 
A variety of motives led artists to seek out interaction and communication with producers of a culture they feel bears some affinity uh, to their own. Unlike the colonial artists' excursion, see the travels of Gauguin, of uh, Emil Nolde or Matisse, whose borrowings fed the discourses and competi competitive relations of European artists, Traveling in early transcultural modernism is about making contact and reciprocal invitations and the creation of associations, organs of uh, publications and institutions. In contrast with Western modernism, this transnationalism crosses the geographical, cultural and racial boundaries of the colonial world order. For example, the beginnings of Indian modernism and its institutions and platforms, the Indian Society for Oriental Art, with its, with its uh, journal Rupam, Rabindranath Tagore's World University and the Art, Academ Art Academy in Shantiniketan, are closely intertwined with the invitations Western and Asian artists received to come to Calcutta which in turn grew out of contacts writers like Tagore and uh, curators like Okakura Tenshin from Japan had built during their travels to Europe, America and Asian countries. The African-American artists of the New Negro Movement came to Paris hoping to establish, and this is again uh, from the Indian-Japanese context, the African-American artists of the new Negro movement came to Paris hoping to establish ties with European modernists as well as discover the so-called ancestral arts of uh, their African roots, which had been discovered by European modernists a few years earlier. One outcome of the contacts between African, Afro-Caribbean and European poets and artists in 1930s Paris was the journal Tropique, which Aimé and Suzanne Césaire published in Martinique in the 1940s. The Cuban, Cuban artist Vifredo Lam, who contributed illustrations, was promoted as the paradigm, paradigmat, paradigmatic creator of an eminently transcultural visual language. The paintings Lam created at this time sought to reconcile pictorial concepts of European modernism with elements of the Afro-Cuban Santeria cults of his native country he had rediscovered after fleeing Europe um, during the Nazi occupation of France. Hybrid figurations blending human, animal and vegetal forms populate pictorial spaces teeming with lush vegetation. The dominant plants in these pictures are sugar and tobacco, products of culture as much as nature, that Cuban sociologist Fernando Ortiz analyzed around the same time in, in his famous book, uh, Cuban Counterpoint, as symbols of slavery and neocolonialism, neocoloniali this is sugar, and uh, on the other hand, tobacco as a symbol of freedom and self-determination even major events that took place much later, like the 1966 uh, Premier Festival Mondial des Arts Negres in Dakar, organized by Leopold Sedar Senghor, may be traced back to the pan-African hotbed of black aesthetic and anti-colonial politics in interwar Paris. On the other hand, just to show how diverse these <coughs> roots um, connecting artists of different regions at the time could be. Um, <coughs> on the other hand, the evolution of the work of Aaron Douglas, probably the, 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 the most important representative of visual art in the New Negro movement, illustrates a very different transcultural constellation, giving rise to the synthesis of modernist aesthetics, African references and African-American politics. He, um, 
did not as the other artists, uh, many other um, African-American artists did travel to Paris, but uh, traveled from Kansas to Harlem. And there he met the German painter William Rice, a painter who had emigra emigrated to New York. And uh, Rice's collaborations uh, with black intellectuals in the 1920s um, was more or less the inspiration for the career of Aaron Douglas. So, uh, it's quite uh, amazing from a distanced viewpoint that a German painter, a white German painter in the 20s could be the, the prominent illustrator of the um, publications of the New Negro Movement in the mid-20s. The backdrop of these artistic projects and the setting that made them possible was the internationalization of the anti-colonial and anti-racist movements in Asia, Africa, Europe and the Americas. These alliances first peaked at the end of World War I, although trans-regional axes of resistance, resistance movements um, had been forged during earlier phases of colonialism, as for instance in the context of the Haitian Revolution in the 18th century. But the Great War was an important factor because, the, for instance, the mobilization of colonized subjects from all continents in the armies of the colonial powers inaugurated wide-ranging migrations of millions of people from the pre-war colonial doctrine, and uh, millions of people whom the pre-war colonial doctrine had assigned to their place. Before the end of the war, the Russian Revolution and Lenin's anti-imperialist politics heralded the arrival of a global player of the people's right to self-determination. Lenin's proclamation in 1917 of the demand for freedom for all colonies would prove a lasting point of reference for the anti-colonial movements. As the war ended, the other lodestar for the peoples living under colonial rule was United States President Woodrow Wilson, whose blueprint for a new peaceful order incorporated Lenin's call for the right of national self-determination. But the great hopes of the colonized world, mainly built on Wilson's problem, quickly evaporated when it became clear that the concept of self-determination would become part of the treaties to be drafted only for European nations hitherto subject to foreign domination and not for the colonies. Uprisings in several Asian and African countries in the spring of 1919 were the immediate consequence when, ex when expectations of a new, somehow post-colonial world order were disappointed. So in India, for instance, protests led to the Amritsha massacre, after which uh, Gandhi's non-cooperation movement spearheaded a growing popular Indian independence effort. This illusionment over the policies of the League of Nations, which reaffirmed the colonial world order, spurred the creation of new structures of transcontinental self-organization among anti-colonial movements. So in February 1919, W.E.B. Du Bois organized the first Pan-African Congress, held in parallel with the Paris peace negotiations, and attended by many delegates from Africa, the Caribbean, and the United States. At the same time, Marcus Garvey's New York-based Universal Negro Improvement Association agitated for a free black nation on three continents. Among its undertakings were the newspaper The Negro World, which was published in several languages, and the shipping company Black Star Line. The Pan-African movement had built its first transcontinental organizational structures after Ethiopia had successfully resisted the Italian invaders in 18, 1896, a victory of great symbolic import for Africa and the black diaspora. Meetings between what were initially only a few black intellectuals, lawyers, etc., from Africa and the African diaspora quickly led to the emergence of extensive transcontinental networks that promoted political agitation. Another important factor 
to be considered in this context is that these were not purely political alliances and publications. Artistic and scholarly contributions played an important part in the efforts to establish new cultural ident identities. That was certainly true from the 1920s onward, when the discursive spaces of the English and French-speaking renaissances of black culture began to cross-fertilize in meetings and publications. Of particular significance were the numerous encounters and relations of exchange between activists, literary figures, and artists who lived in New York, uh, in, in, in Harlem in particular, and Paris, traveled between both cities, and each had their own context in Africa and the Caribbean islands which became manifest in journals like Le Continent in Paris and Opportunity in New York. One scene of such contact has become uh, canonical as the birth of the so-called Negritude movement. Aimé Césaire from Martinique, Léon Damas from uh, French Guinea and Leopold Sédar Senghor from Senegal met in the mid-30s in Paris and came into contact with the African-American Harlem Renaissance artists. This conjunction would have been virtually impossible without the contact space, uh, which has been uh, marginalized by historians later on, uh, the contact space provided by Jane and Paulette Nadal from Martinique, who fluent, whose fluency in both languages, English and French, made them central moderators. They frequented the circle of the writer uh, René Marin and soon kept their own salons in Paris, where blacks from the three continents came together. The activities of the sisters Nadal, who founded uh, the English-French channel La Revue du Monde Noir in 1931, were crucial not only because they mediated between black politics and of liberation and black modernist aesthetics, in the intercontinental horizon, but also by virtue of their reflections on compos composite Afro-European identities, they called that Afro-Latinité, in the colonial and envisioned post-colonial context. One consequence of the aforementioned disappointment over the League of Nations decision to preserve the colonial world order was the Congress Against Colonial Oppression and Imperialism, held in Brussels in 1927, which was attended by delegates of 134 organizations from all over the world, and led to the foundation of the League Against Imperialism and for National Independence. Conventions like this Congress, participants included Chavahalal Nero, Ho Chi Minh, Mohammed Hatta, and Kwame Krumah fostered exchange of experiences, objectives, and strategies, enabled activists to present a united front vis-à-vis -vis the colonial powers and the global press, and prepared the ground for the post-war decolonization process and its conferences. Yet these milestones of global anti-colonial networking would have been impossible without the smaller scale organizational forms and publications that preceded them. So in the 1920s, there were numerous such organizations in Paris alone, including the Union Intercontinentale, the Ligue Universelle pour la Défense de la Race Noire, and the Comité de Défense de la Race Negre, as well as media like uh, Le Cri de Negre, La Race Negre, La Paria, and Le Continent. If Harlem was the cultural center of the black world in the 1920s, these Paris circles and the conferences, like the one in Brussels, were, uh, were the first associations of pan-African-minded and Arab and Asian activists uh, formed. An eminent example of particular interest uh, in, the, in, the, in this context, uh, also in the, in, the, in the art context, 
would be what was presumably the first anti-colonial exhibition called La Verité sur les Colonies in Paris in 31. Often described by art historians as a counter-exhibition mounted by the surrealist, by the, uh, surrealist group against the Paris colonial exhibition, the show, in fact, was a co-production involving the Ligue Universelle pour la Défense de la Race Noire, the League Against Imperialism, founded as the, at the Brussels Conference, and several authors, authors and artists from surrealist circles, and was part of a broad-based protest against the colonial exhibition inis, initiated by the Vietnamese Comité de Lutte and others. The exhibition, which presented African art in front of banners with Marx quotes and contrasted them with Christian fetish objects, as well as related projects such as the dissemination of a fake guide to the official colonial exposition. They, call, they called it La Verité, the Le Veritable Guide de l'Exposition Coloniale, <laughs> which shed a critical light on France's civilizing mission and the circulation of calls for a boycott, ne visitez pas l'exposition coloniale, availed them themselves of propaganda techniques, communication guerrilla tactics, and artistic alienation. The entire campaign is remarkable for the diversity of its methods, as well as the political alliances between African, Asian, and European groups that supported it. The anti-colonialism of many surrealists which went hand in hand with an exoticism that was not without its own problems, may be regarded as the basis of their subsequent relations with poets and painters, especially from the Caribbean, such as the already mentioned Aimé Césaire and Wifredo Lam. The, the inextricable nexus between the colonial world order and racist thinking made it necessary to complement political agitation with scientific counter-arguments. In the African-American context, the encounter between W.E.B. Du Bois, the, the black activist of the time, the, the leader of the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and the anthropologist, the white German uh, um, originated anthropologist Franz Boas, in 1906, when Du Bois invited Boas to speak to his black students at Atlanta University about the accomplishments of Af African civilizations, initiated a cooperation between the black civil rights movement and critical anti-racist anthropology that would last into the second half of, this, of the 20th century. Um, I think I skip a little bit, but what I wanted to mention is these, uh, these discussions between uh, anthropological uh, academics, mostly white, and black uh, activists uh, about the identity of a group like the African Americans. Um, that these discussions were also quite prominent in, in Europe in the context f uh, of the aforementioned um, La Revue du Monde Noir circles in Paris, um, where the search for new identity constructions or new concepts of identity, bridging or in between the classical opposition of European and African, um, was of great um, relevance, where for the Haitian politician and ethnologist Jean Price Maas, who moved in the circle of the Nadal sisters and did research on religious and magical practices in, in Haiti during the uh, American occupation of his country, contributed to a reassessment of the African heritage in the complex composite black identities that Jane Nadal sought to describe with the term Afro-Latin, also Latin for European and Afro. The crux of this context between representatives of linguistically, historically, and culturally diverse regions 
can be summed up in one term, translation. Establishing the internationalisme noir, so black internationalism, Jane Nardal spoke of a required labor of translation in the literal sense that the Nardals, like others, performed with their bilingual genre, but it also required a translation of the experience of contentious confrontation between Western and African culture into a new identity, a double appartenance, double belonging, as Nadal named it, an alternative to the passive assimilation to the Western, to the dominant Western culture, as well as to essentialist concepts of black culture. So uh, the Afro will assimilate the Latin rather than be wholly assimilated by it, was one of these uh, formulations. A characteristic feature of diverse forms of transcultural global modernism in various world regions is that they rethink concepts of culture and identity in constellations that bridge different practices, anti-colonial and anti-racist politics, art, science, philosophy. The thinking and artistic expression of a hybrid, or as Edouard Glisson will later put it, composite culture, as opposed to the long established ones in a hallmark of global is a hallmark of global modernism. Being black and American, like in Du Bois, in du Bois double consciousness, Indian and westernized, like in Tagore's cultural inclusiveness, African and French, like in Nardal's Afro-Latinité, and conceptualizing this experience poses an artistic and theoretical challenge to global modernism. Operating with the concept of, um, of uh, transculturality today, we should not forget that the thinking of transculturality in the context of decolonial movements of the interwar years responded to a political need to combat the colonial borders and their color lines without succumbing to the temptation of new nationalist and separatist concepts. In contrast with the unilateral appropriation of other cultures and other aesthetics in European modernism and the diffusionist idea that innovation is produced in Western centers and then affects the peripheries of the world, the practice of encounter, exchange and alliance across cultural and racial boundaries in transcultural modernism tends to be decentered multilateral and most importantly intentional. So when the Bengali poet Rabindranath Tagore founded his university Viswabharati, the name translates roughly as the world in India or India in the world, <coughs> correctly. Uh, in Shantinikitan near, near Kolkata in 1921, he saw his ambitious project as a counter model to the colonial education system of the British as well as to a narrow Indian nationalism. Aiming to bring, quote, thinkers and scholars of both Eastern and Western countries together, quote again, free from all antagonisms of race, nationality, creed or caste, and to model teaching at the university as a common fellowship of study and meeting of East and West. Tagore hired teachers from many Western and Asian countries to study, quote again, to study the mind of man in its realization of different aspects of truth from diverse points of view. This transcultural and we might say cosmopolitan design, which was reflected by the university's course offers including lectures on Indo-Chinese cultural contexts and contexts between ancient India and the West, grew out of two decades um, worth of intellectual, intellectual preparation and reflection on educational policy in the context of the Indian independence efforts. As early as 1901, Tagore had set up his first alternative and socially inclusive school and in the meantime, his nephews, the painters Abhanindranath and Gaganendranath Tagore, had founded the Indian Society of Oriental Art in 1907. Seeking to define a contemporary Indian or Eastern art, they had initially focused on encounters and exchange with artists from Japan. 
unlike the protagonists of Japanese tendencies in Europe, they made a point of inviting Japanese artists to come to Kolkata and introduce their Indian colleagues to their idea of painting. The latter then fused what they learned from the Japanese colleagues with references to the Indian uh, Mughal painting, Bengali popular art and European modernism. Initially, initially established in the context of the political uh, Swadeshi movement and the cultural Bengal Renaissance, which promoted pan-Asian ambitions to counter the Western British dominance in India, in general and the country's art world in particular, this program of international contacts and invitations was gradually expanded. Among its accomplishments was the legendary ex exhibition held in Kolkata in 1922, which presented Bauhaus art uh, next to works by Indian artists. Some of you may know there, is a, there was a recent reconstruction of this 1922 exhibition in Kolkata in, in the Bauhaus in, in Dessau um, earlier that year. In an important essay, the Indian art historian Partha Mitter has noted that the universalist project of art history, despite the serious efforts of scholars, remains caught up in the compulsions of Western epistemology. The problem, he argues, cannot simply be resolved by an act of self-reflection, self which would be culturally determined in turn, the widespread acceptance of the canon of Western art history, Mitter writes, leads to a phenomenon he calls a pathology of influence. Western art is regarded as the yardstick for all non-Western derivatives. Quote, as an art historical category, influence ignores significant aspects of cultural encounters, especially the enriching value of cross-fertilization of cultures, quote end. We may read this syndrome of thinking, this uh, of, of uh, influence, as, a, uh, as a, the thinking of influence in terms of centers and peripheries of original and imitation as the art historical variant of what the geographer James Blout has described as diffusionism characteristic of the colonizer's model of the world. Mitter recommends shifting from the discourse of originality toward a more heterogeneous definition of global modernism. His methodological proposal is a, quote, contextually grounded study of non-Western modernism that engages with the socially constructed meaning of artistic production. And, uh, of course, I would fully agree to this proposal, but I would also argue that focusing on the context between the protagoni protagonists, protagonists of these modernisms may help us achieve a deeper understanding of the active production of a transcultural modernism. So, I come to the end. Um, over the past 20 years, numerous publications have been contributed to a critical broadening of the perspective on the art of modernism, of the sort Mitter envisioned, so besides uh, his own works. The book series Annotating Arts Histories, edited by Kobena Mercer, is no doubt one of the best major projects of this kind. And what makes it so compelling from my perspective is that most of the many contributions to the four volumes do not sketch something like a global art history. Instead, the monographic or regionally focused essays taken together add up to a radically new panorama of the diversity of conditions, interests and aesthetics of modernist art practice between 1900 and 1980. The, the venture of this publication series um, was underwritten by the London-based INIVA Institute, which was created in 1994, 
as a result of the involvement of artists of Britain's colonial diaspora in the country's struggles over cultural policy. The first symposium, uh, as you may know, because you are closely related to Indiva with this project, um, the first uh, conference organized by Indiva was um, Uh, focused on the critique and uh, redefinition, post-colonial redefinition of internationalism, a concern that grew out of these struggles against provincial and ideological interpretation of the concept in the Western art world. So, for instance, Rashid Arin's uh, demand, publicized in his 1978 um, founded journal Black Phoenix, for, quote, a clear rejection of Western art history as the mainstream and an international movement that would be different from and in opposition to Western art. This would, he writes, this would of course require the development of our own international platform through which we could exchange our ideas directly without Western intermediaries, interference, creating historic links between the peoples whose emergence can offer a new hope to all mankind. Irene eventually created such a platform for art and art history in, the, in his uh, journal Third Text, which uh, came out in 1987. Uh, and the history of global art or art history, just to stay in England for for a moment, um, might be traced back from these institutions, um, yeah, institutions from the 90s, journals from the 80s and the 70s, with Irene's magazines, back to the 1960s, and uh, to, the to the institutions and publications, uh, for instance, uh, David Medalla's Signals Gallery from the 1960s, which, uh, <laughs> which uh, is to be considered uh, an amazing uh, project and a pioneering center of global avant-garde art that, amongst other things, for the first time, presented Brazilian artists Elio Oitisica and Lucha Clark in Europe. Today, some writers and curators convey the impression that the, that the West generally refused to accept the rest of the world as cultural contemporaries until 1989, and that the artists of the South waited for Jean-Hubert Martin and his Magicien de la Terre to usher in their global face. This view of history is false, also when it is dressed up as a postmodern or pseudo postcolonial critique of a Eurocentric modernism. The denial of coevalness, which Johannes Fabian has described for ethnology, may well have informed the politics of the dominant forces of colonial modernity in other fields as well. But the anti-colonial movements and artists of transcultural modernism successfully fought for their seat at the contemporary table a full century ago. With their global contacts, they were well ahead of the European modernists, Western and white internationalism. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, Christian. Um, many things to discuss. I think I have about five points for, for discussion. And maybe um, you, can, you can choose to answer which ones you want and then we can, we can open it up to, to everybody else. Um, so uh, you begin by characterizing your your scepticism of um, Peter Weibel and Hans Belting's typically bombastic and pompous exhibition at ZKM, The Global Contemporary, a show which typically assumes uh, a wide survey 
and which attempts to map uh, so-called global art since 1989. Uh, and I think what's, what's uh, intriguing is that you, you characterize this kind of, um, this kind of you know, bombastic imperative as simultaneously somewhat provincial. Um, it's provincial because of its, its, uh, its kind of disinterest in production before 1989 and in its whether advertent or inadvertent, it's disavowal of, um, of, of the kind of previous, effectively a previous century of cultural production. But I wondered if your, your skepticism about global contemporary is also linked to your skepticism about the, the role that 1989 plays. Uh, the role that 1989 plays as a, as a rupture in the global order, which therefore must be reflected in artistic production. And so if 1989 is not a rupture, then uh, I wonder how you would characterize, um, let's say, the partial continuities before 1989 and after. In other words, how do we understand 1989 if we are not to understand it as this grand rupture as it's popularly understood? So that's the first question. How, you know, your skepticism about it, how do you understand it? Then following on from that, um, you know, a shorthand way of talking about 1989 is effectively the beginning of a, the post-communist condition, broadly speaking. In the generations who were formed by uh, a communist imaginary or a communist horizon, um, on one hand, a condition of speechlessness, um, an inability to speak, on the other hand, a condition of shame. Uh, and maybe, maybe, maybe there's also clearly that those take place against the response of jubilation about the, the supposed end of communism. But to, to go back to, to go back to the anti-colonial uh, archive, to go back to the 20th century of uh, anti-colonial struggles, is to go back to a moment in which um, Effectively, uh, we're faced with what um, the, uh, the activist and uh, 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 journalist and revolutionary George Padmore called a condition of pan-Africanism or communism. You know, a condition in which um, these two conditions uh, effectively faced uh, the, the African proletariat. Um, and that's because um, the return to the anti-colonial means the return to the question, not so much of globalization, but the question of the international, specifically the communist international. Uh, and the, question, the relation of the communist international to the relation of what was called the national question. So, and the national question is, is what was informing um, pan-Africanism, pan-Arabism, pan-Asianism. And these broad, these broad political projects are effectively uh, the matrices within which uh, the, uh, the, the cultural projects that you look at are, are, are forming. They are taking their reference from within these matrices. So you look at the conferences, the journals, uh, like Tropique, the exhibitions, uh, the art schools, and Chantigny Caton in Calcutta. So very different locations, whether you're looking at um, Paris, or whether you're looking at Harlem, whether you're looking at Calcutta. And you know, we could add other places. We could add um, Margaret Trowell's art schools in Uganda. There are many different places we could add. But you could, if, we see, if we see these, let's say, um, something like an organizational complex that is being formed in these cities, then this organizational complex is related to a question of, of um, what uh, Brent Hayes Edwards calls black internationalism. So in, in his book from, from 2003, uh, which is called The Practice of Diaspora, uh, Literature, Translation, and the Rise of Black Internationalism, Brent Hayes Edwards specifically looks at these relations between Harlem and Paris that you talk about. Um, he looks at the role of Jane and Paulette Nadal. He looks at the relation of L'Etudion Noir. And, um, and he, he, he picks up specifically on, on what you mentioned, which is the work of translation. Um, and it's a, it's a very interesting point, which would be great to hear you talk just a, a bit more about. The point when the Nadal sisters 
you say um, they do the work of translation in a literal sense because they are bilingual, but they also do the work of, of transposing this question of bilingualism into a question of double belonging. And it's at this point that you, you use the French term for double belonging. You, your text goes into French and then goes back into English. So your text itself enacts that moment itself that the sisters do. So it'd be great if we could like even just, just uh, pause on that moment where you go from French to English and back again. And it, the point in your, in your text when you, you make the move between French and English and, um, and maybe expand a bit on what it mean on what the work of translation is doing, because it's a crucial moment in the kind of salons that the sisters uh, created, and the salons which then acted as incubators for a journal, and the journal which then acted as something like a, a discourse platform upon, upon which certain claims can be made and can start to travel. So broadly speaking, um, um, the question, the relation of translation to the relation of uh, internationalism, uh, and then the, the question of internationalism to this, to a broad question of um, of, uh, of communism, because I think the fact that this event is called Practice International means that means that there uh, a shift has been made from the question of the global to the question of the international, and and the international to me brings with it. Uh, a spectral communism, uh, whether that's articulated or not, and I, I think it would be it would be intriguing for us to articulate it because this is what it means to to return to moments in the 20th century and to and to to rethink them. And um, just last month in um, Berlin at the Haus der Kultur in der Welt, as you know, there's an exhibition after Year Zero: Geographies of Collaboration, which and and the project is something similar. It's it's it's, it's not unrelated to what we're doing here. And just last Sunday, before I left London, um, at a, an exhibition space called Calvert 22, there was, a, there was um, the beginning of a research project called um, Socialist Friendships, which was looking at the role of the Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow, which, um, after, uh, which after the Stalinist thaw, um, opened up a policy of um, scholarships to students from uh, African countries undergoing decolonization. So, you know, many filmmakers studied at Patis Lumumba University. Um, um, many artists studied at Tashkent in Uzbekistan. Um, um, when when um, Chile uh, underwent uh, a military coup, many Chilean um, mural collectives left Chile and went to Mozambique uh, and, and worked there. And so this workshop began to lay out um, a moment of um, uh, Soviet-African friendships, uh, which, and the, the subtitle was something like um, Tashkent, Maputo, Luanda, something like that. And that already tells you a bit about the geography of collaboration going on there. And I think this, this, this event now that we're embarking in is, is part of that interest. It's part of that return to, to the question of anti-colonial modernities and to the question of, um, of um, uh, contestations of, with communism. Uh, and so then maybe um, another way of putting that would be to, to say, couldn't we characterize the, the German-speaking world, the German-speaking uh, art history world and uh, German-speaking art theoretical world are suffering from a peculiar time lag. Uh, the, uh, the Brent Hayes Edwards book is from 2003. This is already a decade ago. Um, Cobden Mercer's uh, Annotating Art Histories series is from 2004, 2005. I remember reviewing Cosmopolitan Modernisms, the first, first volume for Freeze, I think in about 04. Um, Okwi Enresor's um, uh, The Short Century, of course, is, uh, is from Villa Stuck and from Chicago in 2003. So there's a certain sense in which um, uh, that this archival turn um, has, has been ongoing for a while. And yet, and yet from, your from the way you characterize it, there's a certain sense in which these questions were open, but they haven't yet fully, they haven't yet fully um, um, had an effect. Their intervention has been blunted or has been occluded 
And I wondered if we, we could characterize why that's the case. Um, I have many more points. <laughs> but maybe I should pause please, there. Please continue. Maybe I should pause there for a bit. Yeah, thank you so much for um, your comment. Um, it's, it's, it's really great to um, get this feedback. Um, maybe I'll start with the temporary questions on uh, periodization, but yeah. also on the time lag. Yes. Um, on, the one, on the one hand, it's not so easy, to, uh, it's not so easy to um, to answer if we, if we could really say that the German art history is uh, much uh, belated to, uh, in, in, uh, in comparison to other art histories from, for instance, um, Britain or the, the United States. But uh, in some way it is, but on the other hand you can also say, I, as I, um, in, in the beginning I mentioned, um, very prominent um, books, volumes by James Elkins, for instance, which is uh, uh, who, uh, who is a Ch Chicago-based art historian and who is really one of the global players of global art history. And you can also find this pr the, 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 the problem of this uh, lack of, um, his, uh, of a historical perspective on these sort of sorts of um, Critical interventions you mentioned with Brent Edwards and so on and so on. So this is uh, this is not only German. This is also, this is somehow um, international um, in certain um, certain fields of academic art his art history discourse. Because I think there is a, a uh, there is a certain gap between uh, academic art history and uh, critical theory or um, um, cultural studies and this might be even more the case in uh, Germany than in, yeah, in other countries. Um, but there is also in Germany um, and, and even in Austria there are, um, there are this is, these are more, um, how, to, how to say, marginalized groups but uh, there is, a, there is a consciousness of, of all these writings you mentioned, but this is, these are small circles, it's not the academic art uh, history world, and it's also not um, um, the big curatorial players, although they might mention this liter literature in their bi 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 bibliography in the end of the uh, footnotes but it doesn't have so much uh, effect on the, on the whole packaging of such a project like the Global, contem global Contemporary. Yes. And um, with reference to 1989, um, I think it's not my, uh, it's not my point to, to diminish the importance of 1989 in all its uh, aspects on all its on all possible levels, but um, on the other hand, I'm quite convinced that 1989 does not mean the same for everybody um, regarding to where you live, uh, under which conditions, which, uh, uh, with what kind of history in your in your background, and this is the same with uh, because you mentioned after year zero. Uh, this is somehow the same with 1945, um, although the Second World War had a great impact, I think, on nearly all of uh, all parts of the world. But it's even it's not the we, we, are, we got so used to periodize after after 45 uh, in art history, but also in other um, fields. But for other for other. Uh, for, for people in other continents and other countries, for instance, in, in, in African countries, 1960 could be even more important than 1940, 1945. And so every, every region has its, somehow its own periodization, but in, in the West it's still 
so somehow um, considered as a universal uh, as a universal periodization. But what this uh, is, I think, this refers to a problem uh, which is maybe one of the great challenges of what we have to um, deal with when uh, thinking of other kinds of art history practices, which is the, the question of chronopolitics, and we have to overcome all these kind of uh, ideas of progress and uh, innovation and uh, the opposition of in invention and imitation and all these things. Um, and we can detect uh, some sorts of proto-postmodernisms in other parts of the world, which were much earlier than postmodernism in the West. But it's very difficult to, um, uh, it's a great challenge to find the words, to find the terms for all these um, phenomena. Yeah. I'm somehow struck by your communist um, intervention <laughs> because this is very, in it's very interesting. I was not uh, thinking so much about that when I was writing this article, but um, of course the internationalism of the early 20th century, um, in particular after World War I, is very much related to communism. And on the other hand, our conventional periodization of globalization with 89 is very closely related to the post-communist situation. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm now doing, uh, I'm now starting with a, with a new project on Austrian, um, Austrian colonial histories and Austrian colonial cultures, but also on anti-colonial act activism in Austria, which is a thing you might not uh, expect in the, <laughs> in the early 20th and mid 20th century. And there, for instance, communism, of course, plays a, a major role. Uh, so that, for instance, if you if you find in the archives that. Uh, George Padmore, you mentioned him, that he met with the Indian leader of the British Communist Party. M. N. Roy. Yeah, 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 exactly. They, they both met in Vienna to discuss some activities. Uh, and so this is, and this could, of course, only, I mean, of course, only, it's, it's, that's not true, but it, that happened under the, uh, or based on the on the structures on the networks of the Comintern of that time, so um, even Vienna was a kind of uh, a peripheral, of course, but uh, uh, a crossroad of uh, anti-colonial and communist activities uh, in the in the early 20th century. Uh, this, was, this was around uh, 1927 or 28 or so. Um, yeah, um, what you addressed with regard to the Nadal sisters and their trans work of translation is something that uh, fascinates me in, in my own <laughs> reading <laughs> and, and uh, sometimes writing and thinking. Um, this question of translation um, in the in the literal sense, but also in a, a symbolic or metaphoric sense, and this I was involved in a in a project on transcultural modernism, which was much related to to architecture. But uh, uh, what I did in this project was a kind of historical research into the origins of transcultural thinking. So when did this kind of idea come up? And, uh, and who were the protagonists of these sorts of new, new understanding of culture, culture as a process of translation and of, of process of, of intermixture and so on. And, that's, uh, and, and if you go back in history, 
and, and you ask when does this kind of thinking start and in, in what, under what conditions, in, in which context, then it's very it gets very clear that this is, a, it, it, this is part of the anti-colonial effort to overcome this thinking of culture within borders and the opposition of cultures and so on. And there, of course, the Nadal sisters play uh, an important early role. And uh, not only these two um, figures, but also the, the circle around them. And many of these, yeah, there are many interesting figures like the one I showed together with uh, uh, Markus Gavi in Harlem, Prince Tovalu from, from Dahomey, and uh, yeah, this is the, maybe the, these are the origins, the historic origins of uh, weird, what we are now quite used to name uh, the more uh, complex new ethnicities, uh, complex identities and so on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I stopped at that point and uh, okay, thank give you. you the, thank you so much, give you the, the chance to ask further questions. Yes, let's open up to the audience. <coughs> Any comments? Hi, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, um, uh, you didn't say so much why this kind of amnesia about, you know, a history that, uh, that the, the post-1989 kind of canonization would actually benefit from drawing upon. So I was having a question, could that have to do something with contemporary art and the, 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 the nervous contemporaneity of it where the art world seemed to canonize everything that is thrown into it right now. Oh, okay. Did you hear? Yes, I do. That's one question. And uh, I was just thinking about why, why if you want to if you, if you want to launch an argument about the global art world, so why this fix, fixation really Ha, does it have to do something with this quality of erecting the, 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 or uh, emphasizing the contemporaneity of everything produced right now, uh, canonizing it? That was the first question. The other one relates to the history you're drawing on where you seem to emphasize very much uh, the aspiration to and the potential for, uh, which I, I don't argue with, but, but with the towards a universal or a transcultural uh, boundary crossing element in black renaissance and so on. But it was very much also dressed up in national, uh, in an idiom of the post-colonial or the anti-colonial movement was dressed up in a very much a national uh, idiom as well. And, and Du Bois, of course, and, and they were, uh, uh, and, and, and the specificity of their cultures and, and this striving towards national independence. So if you could just comment on that uh, kind of paradox, or maybe it's not a paradox. Mm -hmm. That was... Thank you. Yeah, why, uh, where does this amnesia come from? I think there is no clear answer to this question, but I would not blame contemporary art uh, for this uh, for this phenomenon, uh, because there are many contemporary artists who are quite um, in, in a very intense way dealing with with, with the histories of uh, of. of of the present, the histories of uh, modernism, modernity, and colonialism, and and um, anti-colonialism, and we have uh, we have had a, a presentation by Wendelin van Oldenburg before, and she's one of these artists who is really, um, as a contemporary artist, really, really uh, um, 
producing very valuable work in that direction. So I wouldn't blame contemporary art, but uh, I mean I could answer that from a very uh, maybe from a, from personal experiences when. <coughs> Everybody, everybody uh, has to start at one point to think about certain questions, of course, and uh, one is earlier and one is later, and uh, everybody is uh, everybody is in a is somehow um, in a in a certain time lag compared to another. But uh, what was uh, fascinating me and also somehow hmm, yeah shocking to me was when. Um, there were several people, not, not, uh, I would, would not like to, to focus it too much on myself, but when I, I, I started to write about some of these issues in the, in the mid or late 90s, and I, I was not so much into the academic, academic field at that time, but coming from art criticism and creating and so, and I got more and more in, invited uh, to these academic conferences of art historians and so on, and that, until a few years ago, in, 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 in Germany, there was um, Austria, Germany, Switzerland and so on, there was nearly no interest in all these questions of transcultural studies, transcultural art histories, whatever. But it started a few years ago and now it's omnipresent. And this is the question which uh, motivated me to write this sort of article. Because um, uh, a few years ago, I was really feeling like a strange outsider at these conferences when the, when the other colleagues did their real art history. And now everybody wants to do this, a kind of transcultural art history or global art history or world art history or whatever. <coughs> and at the, same, at the same time, you face this sort of... Uh, yeah, this lack of historical perspective to who did that already at, uh, at that point in history and so on. And I, I recently was uh, invited in, in to Berlin to f from the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, the German uh, federal, um, the institution who supports the academic research projects, the, the more costly ones to review uh, a new project on transcultural modernism. And uh, I was really shocked, although they had good, uh, also very, very good uh, proposals, but I was shocked about um, how they deal, for instance, with writers and curators from the 1970s. Um, I, I, my last picture was uh, from uh, the Signals Gallery and the group, and. Uh, Guy, Brett. Guy Brett was one of the uh, first um, art historians, art critics in the 70s who had a global perspective or who had a, a transcultural perspective. And now these, these German researchers, they, the, the first, they just start to think about the global and the, the, uh, the, the, one of the first things they do is to dismiss these uh, writers from the 70s and from the 60s because they had no uh, no concise methodological approach to whatever you know. It's uh, it's this it, it's active amnesia. It's it's even active amnesia amnesia if that is possible. But it's not just. Um, but I think there is certain. There is something at stake. Uh, with, uh, art history loses its status more and more. Um, and uh, this kind of uh, self-defense, this uh, sort of um, we have to new, we have now to tackle with new um, challenges, and we have to cover new uh, and different issues and uh, and regions and continents is is very uh, much uh, also very much status-driven, I would say. So this this is maybe one um, reason for amnesia. And the supposed uh, contradictions, contradictions between the transcultural and the nationalist. I mean, somehow even the nationalists were trans, 
cultural and uh, also the, also today there, there was just a, a few year, year, <coughs> a few days ago uh, the European extreme right wing um, parties met in Vienna to form a trans uh, international right wing organization. So that was always the case, I think. And um, on the other hand, there is a strong conflict. That, uh, there is a historic conflict between, f uh, if we speak of, uh, I mean, there is black nationalism on the one hand, and there's on the other, on the other hand, there is pan-Africanism and uh, there's the exchange with, uh, with India and so on and, and also the, the, the African-American uh, activists traveled to India to learn from Gandhi and so on and so there is, I mean this is it's a, a question I cannot answer in a, in a few words and a few sentences but uh, yeah my, my interest is mainly on kind of following the tracks of people who were traveling for certain reasons to, um, to overcome uh, certain political uh, and, and cultural and uh, personal restrictions um, which have to do with um, colonialism, capitalism, racism. Yeah, sorry. It's <laughs> Uh, we have time for one more question. Yeah? Just, uh, you mentioned um, instead of uh, influence or reception, we rather, uh, we'd better focusing on the context and encounters. And uh, I do very much agree with it. But at the same time, uh, the question lingers. So there was a show like uh, Cubism in Asia in uh, several different, I mean, four different museums in Asia, like Singapore, Japan, Korea, another. And also like earlier on, like I think it was like late 90s or early 2000, there was a show called Global Conceptualism. But what it says is that, um, I mean, I was very excited when I kind of uh, got to learn about this show. It, it is somehow like self-confrontation with certain reception, but um, it was a very active form of appropriation mm -hmm. of the form from the West. Yeah. This means that um, um, there is still center, <laughs> And there is the kind of process of reception and influence, whether it's re, uh, kind of turning back the perspective or not. And therefore, the idea of belatedness or too early or too late still <coughs> remains. So I'm just wondering whether there is some kind of framework of thinking uh, about this. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you, you already mentioned it. Uh, how do we deal with this, um, how, which uh, notions do we employ to describe certain um, relations between art that is produced in one place and art that is produced in another place before or after a certain, time, a certain period, a certain date? And the, there's, of course, the influence is a very modern concept and appropriation is a postmodern concept. But, um, so in the West at least, appropriation is a post, is very much, uh, very directly related to postmodernism. So from a, from a Western point of view, um, from Western art history writing, there is no appropriation in modern art before the late 1970s or early 1980s, uh, when it started in a certain US American uh, context. And this is of course, uh, this is of course related to the idea that um, the center and periphery model of, uh, of modernity is not 
longer um, valuable at, uh, yeah, um, in that way and that with multiculturalism and everything uh, in, the, in, the, in the 80s, uh, 70s, 80s, it, the situation changed. But when you um, go back to many non-Western art practices of the early or mid-20th mid century, and you see how artists, like for instance, Wifredo Lam, whom I mentioned in my, in my talk, how they deal with uh, European art, European modernism, and um, try to reappropriate what modern art has appropriated from the arts of Africa and other parts of the world, it's it's very di it's, it's, it's very very much um, very directly connected to the issue of appropriation as a political as a political uh, practice, and it's it's even written in 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 Wifredo Lam's um, writings, for instance, that this is a political act to reappropriate the art of his own culture, of his own ancestors, from the misuse, although he, he loves Picasso, but it, somehow it's a misuse of his, um, of his cultural background. But I think it's really um, not easy to, to find the the precise um, terms, notions, words we employ for these uh, processes. And uh, f if, we, if, we create, uh, if we organize an exhibition with the title Cubism in Asia, it's from the first point, it's of course uh, uh, ins that it's inscribed into this project that you have this idea of center and periphery and uh, um, the origin and the the influence or the the copy or so, but uh, yeah. Sorry. I think we have to save uh, any further questions for the final discussion at the end of of uh, the <laughs> evening, and say thank you very much to uh, Christian Carvagna. Very happy that you could make it.